Everett, we are glad that you're here worshiping with us. I know you're waving at me, Alan. It's okay. It's good to see you as well. This morning as we gather, I'd like to just highlight a couple of announcements as we begin. Uh, first, it's not in there, but uh, next week we spring forward, which is my favorite time of year. I mean, I know I'm seeing all these. I love springing forward. I don't understand what your, uh, what the problem is. It makes me feel like there's more light outside. It's exciting. Uh, spring training is coming to fruition, and its opening day is coming up. So it's just exciting. So just to let you know, if you show up at this time next week, you will be in time for coffee hour. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, there's not in the bulletin, but uh, uh, we are getting ready for Easter, and Easter is the later this month on March 31st, and one of the ways that we are looking, we are looking for uh, maybe one or two people, uh, our, our preschool teacher, Sharon Ferris, she is going to be leading the nursery, but we need one or two other adult volunteers in the nursery to make it a safe place for people to come who might have young children to come uh, and, and bring them. So if you're interested in helping out in our nursery on Easter morning uh, from about 9.45 to 11 o'clock, uh, please let me know. We're looking for one or two extra adult volunteers to be with Sharon in our nursery to provide for those who will be coming to worship here on Easter morning. Tomorrow, uh, Ken Newman and I will be in the alley accepting any extra food donations from 10 to noon. We hope you join us uh, to support the Volunteers of America uh, food program here in our community, uh, either today with non-perishable foods or tomorrow through the alley. Men's breakfast is coming up this upcoming Saturday at 8.30 in Stalker Hall. All men are invited. Uh, tomorrow, Oh, I'm actually wrong. Excuse me. In a week from tomorrow, uh, Priscilla Circle meets on March 11th. Uh, next Sunday, we're excited to have a documentary called Accidental Courtesy, uh, Daryl Davis, Race and America. It's going to be a wonderful movie. Uh, Corey Cantor and I have been talking a lot about racial reconciliation and what that might look like in different areas. And he found this movie. It's a documentary about a man named Daryl Davis who befriended uh, KKK people and uh, his journey with them. It's a documentary, it's about 96 minutes long. We will have lunch, uh, beginning at 11.30, we'll have lunch and discussion following the movie next week. Uh, this week we have Scrabble at one o'clock on Wednesday if you're interested. Uh, due to the fact that we are celebrating Hugh Miner's life this afternoon at 2 p.m., there's no adult Sunday school. So after worship, hope you join us for a coffee time. Hope you get a cup of coffee and a cookie and share and greet one another. Uh, but there's no Sunday school because uh, for those who are coming back, we want to give you space to have a little bit of lunch and then come back to honor, to be with the Minor family and honor Hugh's life. If you're interested in having lunch with me, Monday at noon in the library. Uh, and our Thursday Bible study continues in the book of Job on our Zoom platform at 4 o'clock. Uh, there is a lot going on, plus we're getting ready for Easter with Palm Sunday on the 24th with a, a worshipful cantata, and then Easter Sunday, we do have a sunrise service out at the Muckleteal Lighthouse Park at 6.30. Uh, we're going to have a brunch at 9 a.m. here before worship and worship at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. So there's a lot going on. I hope you feel invited to join with us in the activities of our church. I'd like to invite Shirley Newman to come forward and lead us deeper into worship with our call to worship. Good morning. Good morning. If you are able, please stand for the call to worship. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, great and wide. Creeping things innumerable are there. Living things, both small and great. There go the ships and the moving of them that you the forward to sort in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. 
When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Please join me now in the prayer of confession. Christ calls us to live lives in harmony with our God and our neighbors. Even our best efforts fall short. Yet our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Trusting that abund abundant mercy, let us confess our sin together. Lord of all, we confess that we have not kept your commandments. We bow down before idols, declaring our allegiance to other powers and principalities. We take your name in vain, using it to justify our own prejudices and opinions. We do not make adequate time to rest and remember your goodness, nor to revel in the delight family and friends. We look the other way in the face of violence and oppression, misogyny and assault, land grabs and unjust economic practices. Our dishonesty and greed get the better of us. Yet you give us commandments not for condemnation, but so that we might live in justice and joy. Purify us by your righteousness and enfold us in your grace. Sanctify our intentions and actions that our lives may begin to reflect your beloved community. Realign us with your spirit and renew steps with you. 
Let's take just a few moments for silent personal confession and reflection. Here are these words from the Apostle Paul. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The grace of Christ is sufficient for us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me now in passing the peace to those around you. May the peace of Christ be with you.
Thank you, choir. It's been nice to have Ed and Gary playing over here. And thank you for, for the wonderful anthem. Of course, for those online, sorry, I did not have my microphone turned on, so you might not have heard me. Um, miss one Sunday, you forget everything, right? <laughs> Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew as well as from the Gospel of Luke. First from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. This is during the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is preaching, and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing, considering the lilies, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow? They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and then thrown tomorrow into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And then in the Gospel of Luke. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. And they asked him, where do you want us to make preparations for it? And listen, Jesus said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So I want to thank our friend Danae Ashley for leading worship last week. I appreciate it. So my, I was, uh, Vicki and I were at my parent, my home church, my parents' church, and so I watched the first part of the service because they begin at 1030, and then I watched uh, the sermon a little bit later in the week. I appreciated Danae's reminder to us that part of our soul care is to acknowledge grief. Indeed, the lack of noting the grief and trauma in our lives can be a hindrance to our overall healing. I also appreciate your grace in allowing me to take a vacation. Unlike many pastors, what happens in Vegas does not need to stay there for me. I grew up in Las Vegas, and Vicki and I went to celebrate our sixth wedding anniversary, and we stayed with my parents. We had a great time. Uh, from the sticking of the landing by the pilot as we arrived, I mean, we were pff, 10. Uh, to the exciting U2 show at the Sphere, we had a relaxing and full time. Now, while for many, Las Vegas connotates casinos, gambling, and debauchery, we may have the, tendence, the, the tendency to overlook the abundance of good food in Las Vegas. Now, we may wish for the days of past when there might have been such a thing as a 99 cents buffet. Now, please do not eat a shrimp cocktail for that price. <laughs> However, Las Vegas now allows visitors to eat well. And one of the last minute adjustments we made was to eat at Gordon Ramsay's kitchen. I enjoy good food, and I like to watch cooking shows. And on these shows, I have seen many MasterChef competitors attempt to follow Gordon Ramsay as he makes 
his signature dish. And it was time for me to see what all the fuss was about. So I decided for an anniversary meal, I wanted to eat Gordon's famous beef wellington. And this might have been the first time in my life when I went to a restaurant and I did not need the menu. Beef wellington and sticky toffee for dessert, thank you very much. Now, yes, Vicky is, is good to me, and she made me share a salad to get some other stuff in me, you know, and, and, and I, don't, I don't drink, so I had a fun mocktail, but with the main course, I was not disappointed. Gordon Ramsay's Beef Wellington was very good. Perfect, medium rare, pastry cooked in a tight wrap, seasoned, and a pleasure to eat. If we had not decided to walk down to see the Arboretum in the fountains of the Bellagio, I may have asked for a cot and took a nap. <laughs> in our Lenten season, as we take some time to care for our souls, today we are going to reflect on eating well. Our theme for Lent, this season in the church between Ash Wednesday and Easter, is Soul Check. As Lent invites us to reflect on our lives, we are taking time to reflect on our souls, to check them in relationship with God and with others, and to take time to care for our souls as we prepare for Easter. Now, for our time during the sermon, I know it's a little bit difficult, but we're going to pretend like this sanctuary is not just a place to find respite for our souls, but this is a soul spa, a place where we can slow down, read deeply from God's word, release our grief and sorrow to the spirit, and today to eat well at Jesus' invitation. I have pondered this invitation to eat well. Now, I am not going to prescribe a diet, a fast, or a biblical eating plan. I am not going to suggest the cleansing of our guts. I do not have a graph to point to and to show how many fruits and vegetables, grains and proteins should be contained on our dinner plate. We are not going to try to convince each other which is the best ice cream flavor or where one can find the best apple fritter, though I know that answer. <laughs> each one of us has items that we enjoy eating, those snacks or candies that get us every time, the cookies that we will sneak while no one is looking or before the memorial service this afternoon, and our version or recipe or place to get the best of something. Each of these are part of what we could think about regarding eating well. Eating well involves more than just good, proper, or healthy choices. I would suggest even eating well means sometimes having something really sugary and sweetie, sweet if we can stand it as long as it's good. Eating well is the difference between shoving food in our mouths and taking time to enjoy, to acknowledge, reflect on, and be present for the food and the people before us. And as we think about eating well, we may feel a tinge of guilt. I did. As I, as I prepared for this sermon, I actually thought about scrapping it because how could I talk about eating well, even though I fully note that I'm blessed to be able to eat in a nice restaurant, I can afford groceries, and I have no health restrictions or conditions limiting my ability to sample food when others are not as fortunate, privileged, or have access like me to such or any food. To top it off, talking about food seems like a luxury when we know that there are people starving around the world. People right now are dying in Gaza, where our country is airlift, airdropping food just for basic survival. And we may think, Pastor, so you're going to talk about eating well when all this is going on? I know. When the Holy Spirit led me to read the verses today, I almost laughed thinking about Jesus telling those listening to him on a hillside, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Jesus points to the birds. They, they are a valuable little, uh, you know, lesson, object lesson. He points to the bird, birds and says, they neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Jesus points to the flowers on the field, and he says, they neither toil nor spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was not clothed 
like one of these. We may wonder, was Jesus speaking to a Fortune 500 company, an executive board retreat, or the top 1% of his population? Was he speaking to people who would go, of course not, Jesus, we will not worry about these things. No, Jesus was talking to people just like him, Jewish sisters and brothers with some Gentiles mixed in who were being oppressed by the Roman tax and political structure. He was talking with people who knew what it was like to be hungry, to go without. And those people who knew how to worry. Still, Jesus, in the sermon here, had the audacity to say, therefore, do not worry about what you will eat or drink or wear. We can only imagine his disciples hearing this might have been wondering, great, this means he's not going to take an offering. How are we going to eat tonight? And those listening might be thinking, well, you had me at blessed are the poor and peacemakers, but you lost me at do not worry about being happy in the face of a stomach grumbling or the painful look of an elder or child as their stomach grumbles because that, Jesus, is too much. Gratefully, Jesus does not say faith alone removes us from the physical parts of life. Verse 32 reminds us that indeed our Heavenly Father knows that we need all these things. Jesus knows we will worry. Jesus knows that worrying over food and clothing takes a lot of space in our heads, in our minds, in our lives. It's a natural thing to worry about for us and those we love. But God also knows we need those practical things of life. Jesus then does something a little bit different here. I, I really struggle with this. He might be inviting us not to wallow in worry, but to act, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And this might not sound like a very, this might sound like a way around being practical. Like Jesus has just said to us, don't worry about food, but if you just seek God, then miraculously hunger, insecurity, and famine would go away. We could slip very easily into blaming the victim. Like they're hungry, that means they haven't, they've worried too much. Jesus does not do that. Jesus does not say, claim, or insinuate if people would just seek God, there would not be food, clothing, housing, or economic issues. Jesus does not say, if you just seek God's kingdom and righteousness, then you will be full, flush, fresh, and free. Jesus does not give false hope or cheap grace. And that's why we need, that's why I was grateful that the verses from Luke were paired with us today. In Luke, the time is getting closer for Passover, and Jesus says, sends Peter and John ahead to prepare the meal. The natural question is, where to go. And Jesus gives the most bizarre instructions. Go to the city, and there you will meet and follow a guy with a jug of water. And when he enters the house, just tell the owner Jesus sent us for the guest room. And voila, there's an upper room fully furnished, and it just needs you to make some final adjustments, and we're ready for Passover. Yes, this is an amazing miracle of preparedness. This is also an example of seeking first God's kingdom and not from the disciples' point of view. We do not know. I mean, the assumption would be that the owner of the house did not hear Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was up in the Galilee area. This last Passover in Luke was in the Jerusalem city. They may have heard of Jesus, but the point is the directions from the man with a jug of water going to a house where an owner is receptive to Jesus' request, shows people attuned to God's kingdom and seeking God's righteousness first. The man with the jug did not have to welcome these two strangers, but those seeking first God's kingdom welcomes others. The owner of the house did not have to have an upper room available or even respond positively to the request the teacher asks you. Yet those who seek first God's righteousness are ready to receive Jesus when Jesus asks. Jesus knows worry is present in our lives. Jesus knows we are concerned with both valid and unimportant things all the time. Jesus knows we are human because he is human. Jesus worried. 
Jesus was concerned for things and people, yet he sought first his Father's kingdom and righteousness. Rather than let worry take his focus away from those he was teaching, like the disciples did about feeding the large crowds in the Gospels, Jesus sought God first. Rather than allow those who did not follow him to get under his skin and feel the need to call down fire from heaven as James and John wanted, Jesus enacted God's righteousness and continued along the path that he was led on. The good news is not figuring out how to live life stress or worry-free. Instead, good news is seeking God's kingdom and righteousness, overcoming the barriers to open us and others to life in Christ. Now, let's think about it this way. Some of us are champion warriors. Other of us, others of us stress out over things like food, fairness, justice, clothing, where is the best donut found, and the list grows. Every time we worry or stress about one of those things in our lives, Jesus invites us to seek God's kingdom and righteousness. Jesus says, seek God's kingdom and righteousness first. He says, Take, he says worry takes us away from where God is. Jesus tells us worry can cloud our vision and therefore we may miss out on the miracle, direction, or solution God may have for us right there. Jesus tells us worry can remove us from the right path such that we forge ahead without any true cause or purpose. We just are out there acting without, with, without God. We are invited like the disciples to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We are invited, like the disciples, to put away idols and seek first the Lord. We are invited, like the disciples, to go where Jesus leads, to follow him and to obey, even when it just seems like we're going to the next town over. We are invited to be hospitable because we never know when the Lord will need our time, our room, or our lives. We are invited to see others with Jesus' eyes rather than focusing on the small differences between us because when we focus with Jesus' eyes, we can maybe see ways to actually feed and care and relieve the worry for ourselves and others. We are invited to see that there is plenty for all and that God's kingdom can feed those who are hungry and serve those who are alienated. Our invitation to seek God's kingdom first may lead us to think that we are automatically righteous. Here's a caveat. We may begin to believe our vision of God's kingdom is the way it could or should be. But, me, but being morally and justifiably right teeters on the verge of making God's kingdom in our own image. Instead, God's righteousness always refocuses us on Jesus to be more and more like him. And this requires grace that only Jesus can give. Grace which releases our worry and control. Grace to cover our sin, our pride, and our ego, and to restore us and rebuild bridges that we may have burned or ignored. Grace to welcome the stranger because we have been welcomed first. Grace to focus on a kingdom where the symbol of a table evens out life's discrepancies. And then grace to come, to sit, to be present at the table that Jesus has prepared. Indeed, we are invited to have communion with him again today, a table where all are welcome, all will be fed, or all will be reconciled, and we are promised and hope that all will be well. Eating well is not just about food. It's a lot larger. It links the growth, the harvesting, the production, the cooking, the host, and the eating, and those around the table, all those things. Even if it's a quick bite, we can eat well. Our soul is cared for when we eat, when we know how eating alone or with another is about part of being God's in God's kingdom. It's about the radical claim God does provide and through Jesus will make our world right. It is about grace working in us, guiding us and aligning us the way we live, the way we care for others, the way we are prepared, the way our hearts move toward Jesus first. 
moving that wave will remind us that our lives are redeemed and refined with a righteous kingdom vision. Amen. Now let's take a moment. Let's take a moment and stand and sing our hymn of preparation, number 514. So one of my goals this Lenten season, one of my goals is to slow down when I eat. I am failing miserably. <laughs> I eat really fast. We believe that this table represents a place where Jesus was sharing a Passover meal with his disciples. We do not know if some of them were fast eaters or not. It does not matter. Jesus held them together. Jesus welcomed them to the room in the city where Peter and John had prepared the meal. And Jesus did something unique during their time. And whether or not they were eating quickly or slowly, they did not grasp. And we are still learning. Because when Jesus changed the liturgy and meaning of the bread and the cup, he did something different. He welcomed us all to this table. This is not a Presbyterian table or a table here in a church or some sort of specialized table. This is a table that Jesus has opened to anyone who puts their hope and their trust in him. And we commemorate and celebrate that on that night that Jesus was eating with his disciples. Even when he knew what was coming, he took the bread. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And we take these common elements, the bread and the cup, and we continue the meal to which Jesus invites all disciples to come, to take, to be nourished, to come and drink and be refreshed, to be present and know no matter how fast or how slow you eat or come to Jesus, God's mercy, love, and grace are given to you. 
This morning, I'm going to invite those who are serving to come forward. We are going to uh, come back to an intinction type of celebration. So um, when you come, we're going to invite you to take a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup. Take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. So here we're gonna. We ha- I know our deacons. We haven't done this in a bit here. So you're gonna hold that. And you're just gonna step back just a little bit. No, you get to hold it. I know. And, and just in case for those who don't want to uh, p- take a piece of bread or dip it in the cup, we do have the prepared communion cups as well uh, for anybody. Uh, and for those who are not able to come forward. A deacon and I will come and uh, uh, serve you uh, during this time of our meal. So friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us take a moment in prayer. Lord, this morning we are grateful that you have met us. That even before we arrived here, your spirit called us into this place. Your spirit made made an invitation for us to be here, for us to be open to what you are speaking to our hearts. Whether or not that came from a greeting, a hymn, the scripture, or even just a time of communion, Lord, you are speaking to us. Allow us to have the hearts, the lives, the ears that are open to receive your word. Remind us, Lord, that no matter how fast or how slow we go, that we are or we can be free from worry. Maybe not free from worry, but we can put worry in its proper place, Lord, where you call us to seek first you, your kingdom and your righteousness, where we, when we seek you, are open to being generous, open to receiving, open to seeing solutions, open to seeing that the way things seem or tend to be do not have to be, or that you are offering something different to us as individuals, as a community, as a world. We pray, Lord, that we would be oriented towards that in all that we say and do. And Lord, this morning, Lord Jesus, as we have come to this table, as we have been fed by you and welcomed by you, remind us of your deep love. Remind us that we are forgiven, that whatever sin or darkness or whatever thing we try to hide in our lives or in our hearts away from others or from you does not need to be that way. That you love us, that you desire to restore us, to free us, to remove the bondage and the chains, those things that hold us down away from us so that we would be free in your spirit. That we would have the fruits of the spirit grow in our lives and that those would be shared with others. We thank you, Lord, for your deep love and care for us, for the fact that the, the cross and the grave did not hold you down, but in grace and mercy you rose again and have restored us. We are grateful for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we turn our lives toward him. Thank you, Lord, for this moment of worship and stillness in your presence. We give you all glory and honor. Amen. Now, before we sing the Lord's Prayer, let us stand, receive the benediction. Friends, let's go from here. Let's go from here knowing that we, that we can eat well, knowing that because as God loved us, we can receive that and share that love with others. So let us go from here in love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Be with us, guide us, support us, surround us, and lead us always. Amen.